Is there more daylight in the Pantheon in Rome or in your own living room? Or better yet, do you think that if the Pantheon would have had more light, would that make the experience in there even better? The short answer is no. The long answer, well, that's however long this video is going to take. <laughs> so we'll find out together. Please hold. The reality is, it's not a matter of quantity when it comes to daylight. It's a matter of quality. And it's this quality which makes for the magic of daylight. In order to understand this quality, I broke it down into three fundamentals, principles, foundations. Let's call them principles. I'm Pedro, I'm a licensed architect here in Belgium with 15 years experience and I specialize in sustainable environmental design. So going back to daylight, as I just said, it's a matter of quality and therefore it's not a matter of quantity. What I'm trying to say is we should not look at daylight in absolute terms, but rather in relative terms. And I don't mean in relative in relation to the Pantheon back in Rome. That was just an example, as I'm sure you know. <laughs> I'm very excited because this is one of my favorite topics. And I think I have a lot to bring to the table. So let's get to it. The first of these principles I was just referring to starts with you. And I don't mean you, particularly you, one of my millions of subscribers. I mean us, us as people and how we perceive the space, the luminous space. To better explain this, I describe a phenomenon you have experienced at least once today already and you experience on a daily basis. The second one of these principles or concepts uh, is about how the design of windows can affect our perception of the space. And the final one is a rule of thumb. I hope that made sense. To be honest, I didn't learn any of this in architecture school, but I learned this in London at the AA while I was doing my training on sustainable design. And let me be clear, I hold nothing back against my teachers back in the Universidad de Buenos Aires in Argentina. They were brilliant teachers. Unfortunately, this is something that is not just widespread enough. And that's the reason for this video. And this video becomes even more important when we understand that these principles are just not complicated at all. And best of all, they're quite easy to apply. <laughs> That's why I want them to be more mainstream. So, I told you I was going to tell you about a phenomenon you experienced at least once today. Well, the suspense is over. <laughs> Chances are that when you got up this morning, you hit the light or drew up the blinds, and in an instant, your light environment changed. With that change, your eye adapted. And probably you rubbed your eyes or something just to comfort them, because your eye was going through a process of adaptation. This adaptation is what allows us to be capable of reading with just moonlight or one lux, or on a sandy beach again with 30,000 lux. This is amazing, but it comes at a cost. You see, when a lot of light hits our eye, our pupil expands so that less light hits the retina in the back of our eye, more or less like what would only be a very expensive camera shutter. And this adaptation is fairly quick, adapting to bright lights, but it can take up to half an hour to adapt to a dim lit space. I'm pretty sure you're aware of this adaptation, but what is important about this is its impact in architecture. When our eyes adapt to bright lights, spaces which could be bright, by contrast, seem dark. So in a side lit room, the space immediately next to a window is going to be very bright. But as we get farther and farther away from that light source, lux levels are going to drop exponentially. And beyond a certain point, that it's just going to seem dark. Maybe you have enough lux to meet a certain standard or requirement set by law or whatever, but because it's next to a very bright source, such as a very bright window, your eye is going to adapt to that spot next to the window and the other space is going to seem a lot darker than it really is. So that's what I meant when I said that we have to look at light in relative terms. We need to understand that light has to be well distributed throughout in order to achieve a good luminous environment. And this is very hard to achieve with side lighting 
when we have windows in our walls, <laughs> which is in most cases. And now for the second point, and as I said before, it is related. It's no secret that we architects love big windows. I love them as well and I use them. Here's an example of a house where I installed this big massive window in the dining room and I think it looks great, but I did this with certain precautions. More on that on the dedicated video of that project, which will be coming out soon. But back to topic at hand, what if I told you that as great as these windows are, providing that visual connection between outside and in that we architects love so much, in spite of all this, they could also be contributing to a problem in terms of light environment or daylight distribution. Why? Because those massive windows, which are floor to ceiling high, are concentrating a lot of light next to the window again and not pushing enough light further back. Let's look at this example in the Terne de Valls in Switzerland, done by renowned architect and brilliant architect Peter Sumtor. This is a lovely project. And look at this window. Sumtor utilizes these big windows very strategically to reinforce a link with the outdoor environment. This effect is all the more powerful because you come from a dimly lit space. So again, your eye is adapting to that. So that contrast is what makes this light source so beautiful. Also because you come to this space turning a corner. So the source of the light, that big window, you don't see it until you turn that corner, which makes it all that more mysterious. I mean, you can imagine it, of course, as you're walking past, you're going to notice or you're going to think that that light is coming from outdoors, but you have to be there to understand the magic I'm talking about. It's very hard to convey good architecture throughout any medium other than just experiencing it. But big windows, particularly when used from floor to ceiling, as I love to do so, have their drawbacks for our lighting environments. At least in our everyday buildings where we're not trying to generate a particular atmosphere as Sumter was with his thermal valves, the project I just showed. You can imagine that big windows have big problems regulating that thermal balance of buildings, but I'm not going to go into that in this video. This video I'm dedicating it to daylight, and even for daylight, these windows could be troublesome. And that's something important to take note of. Because you see, if the window comes all the way to the floor, then that space next to the window is going to be incredibly bright. Very, very bright, in fact making the rest of the space seem darker just by comparison, not because there's an actual lack of lux, which is the unit of measurement for light levels, but it's simply because it's next to a bright pack. And this brings us to the conclusion of this topic, and it is that the higher the window, the better the light is distributed in that space. So if I have a window which is very low in the wall, it's going to lit a space right next to the window and not at all the space on the back. In the opposite case, where I have a window high up in the wall, then that light will be coming all the way back in the room, making a better overall light environment. And that brings us to our third and final point. So now that we know, and we went through how the eye adapts to a particular light environment and how light can be pushed further back by raising the height of the window, we have to know what the implication is of that in architecture. Well, we all think that light comes from the sun and that is true up to some extent. But the reality is that the light that we use to light up our spaces should be preferably bounced around. Light coming directly from the sun is just too bright. And this is exactly what our sky dome is doing. And this is what Vitruvius figured out over 2,000 years ago, one year before the birth of Christ actually, he figured out that if you go deep enough into a space where you no longer see the sky, as of that point, the space is not going to be properly lit. That rule of thumb sticks until today. Of course it won't change, the physics didn't change. You might, might be thinking, well, what about the light that bounces off other walls or windows and comes and hits the back of the room? This would be called the ERL, Externally Reflected Light. And the ERL tends to be 90% weaker than the light we receive directly from the sky, which is the SC, sky component. 
A modern version of what Vitruvius found out is actually referred to as passive zone. Passive zone would be the area that could be properly lit with natural means and would cover a space which would be about two and a half times the height between the highest point of the window and the floor. So if your window is two meters tall, then your passive zone would extend to five meters in. As I said before, today we can do some simulations which are not complicated and people should start asking for to determine if spaces are properly knit or not. Actually, we ourselves, we rushed a project and our solution was not adequate enough. Here's a plan of our first proposal and you can see that the spaces were just not properly lit. We knew before running the simulations that it was probably going to be the case. We also knew that it wasn't the final draft, so we weren't too worried. But it did bring some problems because everybody loved the design, but we knew we had to review it. And then we did review it, and you can see now the light distribution is significantly better. And we're making better use of that passive zone. So this is a concept that has to be applied. And passive zone, you don't even need to do any simulations or calculations. You can just determine, okay, this is the depth of my passive zone. This is what I'm going to be lighting naturally. I'll probably do another daylight video because I just love this topic so much and I left some things not covered. But I think that these are the basic concepts. Now, if you like this video, you don't need to drop a like or subscribe or any, you don't need to do any of that. If you watch this far, that's already good for me. Thank you. <laughs> you may want to learn more about solar radiation and solar movement. I've done a few videos on that, so don't hesitate to take a look at them. Okay, that's all for me now. Thanks. Bye. See you in the next one.